Um, hello, my name is Gina Bai. I am a assistant professor of the practice at Vanderbilt. I, and I am excited to be here to talk about how novice testers perceive and perform testing. And uh, we will be focusing on unit testing, which is the most basic level of software testing. So to begin with, I would like you to make a guess. Uh, you can share that on Slack. So how much does the poor software quality cost the U.S. in 2022? Make a great, brave guess. $1.4 billion? It's actually at least 2.41 trillion. That's about like 10% of the GDP um, U of US of that year. Um, I, I know like this is horrible, right? And I'm sure this will raise the awareness of testing as a critical software engineering activity, as well as the awareness that our developers and of course our testers need to be able to perform testing well, right? However, um, Titus Winters, who's a principal software engineer at Google, like he pointed out that most of their new grad hires, unfortunately, have very limited experience with testing. So testing skill and knowledge is one of the um, gaps between CS education programs and industry expectations of um, graduating students. And it is an open question for all of us that how to establish, how to enhance students, uh, the new hires, or let's say the novices testing skills. So to do so, the first step is to learn how novices perceive and perform testing. For most novices, they see no difference between testing and debugging, or think that the purpose of testing is to show the correctness of the program. Well, um, because in most CS education programs, especially the undergraduate programs, students are usually expected to implement their uh, programs given the description, make sure they compile, they run, they pass all the test cases provided by the instructors. And in some courses, students are also expected to um, write their own tests to test their own programs or programs implemented by their peers. But in general, if all test cases pass, that usually means that's awesome. The program is ready for submission. If no, it's time to debug. So I would say it's not surprising at all to see that the novices feel uh, like they, they have the blurred conceptual line between testing and debugging. But the question is, can we say a program is 100% correct or is it perfect if it pass all the test cases? Could it be the case that the testing is just not effective enough to capture, to review the failure? Or could it be the case that some of the tests themselves were just not correctly designed and implemented? So what we are trying to do is to train the novices um, to help them build the testers mindset and to be able to um, identify to figure out the testing scenarios, and especially the uh, like corner cases that may break the program. So that's the level two thinking. And of course, we want to help the novices to eventually get to level three to realize that testing can only show the presence of the failures, but not their absence. Uh, we test the programs, we test the, so um, the software to reduce the risk of causing like bad consequences or even catastrophes. And let's um, and let um, testers mindset to actually guide us to better design and develop the software. So that's how the novices perceive testing. And let's see how they practice unit testing. Uh, we conducted a, a, like several studies exploring their testing behaviors and performance. And here I'll present several um, representative questions from the novices. So the first one, Amy had a typical question when the novices are going up to level two from level one. She was not sure like how to interpret and handle a task that failed. Is it okay to have a failing task? Does it mean a bug in the source code or is a mistake in the task code? We observe um, several cases in which the, um, the participants, the novices, um, even though like even when they were informed that there were at least one bugs in the code, they still trust the code over than the program specifications. And they try to cover that source code regardless of the correctness. 
Um, and Bob needed guidance on when to stop testing. Is it determined by the number of test cases? Could it be like should it be should should it be the case that everything needs to be tested? And how to make sure everything is tested? Can we stop testing after, uh, for example, finding one bug? This can actually be um, like this question can actually be partially solved by consulting coverage tools like ECL Emma, which tells you like the user whether the test cases are actually covering the source code and how much the code is exercised. But we observed no adoption of tools like these um, in our studies. This also suggests that the lack of exposure of um, testing tools for novices. At the same time, we also observed some extreme cases in which the novices wrote dozens of tests for just one single method, and all of them were testing the happy path. Um, Charlie had difficulty in reusing the code examples from online resources, and Daniel cannot figure out how to actually implement the test to indicate the existence of the bug. So in our study, we also found several novices were like who were able to identify to design the unhappy past task cases, but they ended up deleting all the task cases only because they cannot figure out the correct syntax, for example, to assert an exception is thrown, so they just gave up. But in general, novices found it challenging to determine what to test and how to test. They have no consensus on what makes a unit test good, and hence novices um, find it challenging to determine when to stop testing, and they tend to only, um, to only test the happy path this. Additionally, novices often create test cases that mismatch the program specifications, and they face the implementation barriers. Uh, this could be from their um, the lack of hands-on testing practices, or it could be some misunderstanding of the uh, program descriptions. But in response to those challenges and with the consideration of cognitive load, well, because of, uh, for novices, like they have to um, learn new syntax, new concepts, new libraries, new tools to be able to practice testing. So we hope to keep the extra cognitive load as minimal as possible when we introduce the tool support. So we introduced a lightweight checklist intervention. Why checklists? Since checklists were able to, like, they, they're so simple, right? And they're also found useful in other software engineering uh, research areas, such as code review and um, software inspection. And a big picture of the checklist is that it is static, which reduces the learning curve for novice testers. And it is lightweight enough to be transferred across classrooms, training programs, and languages, including natural languages and programming languages. And if we take a closer look at the checklist items, um, we can see that it is separated into two levels of abstractions, one for test cases and one for test suites. Um, each abstraction level also has two sets of um, checklist items, the items that they should do, representing the important required elements, and the items that they could do, representing the best testing practices. So um, it contains tutorial information. It briefly introduced the use of test class components. The checklist also provides the testing strategies, for example, the equivalence class partitioning and uh, boundary value testing. We didn't explicitly uh, name those strategies in the checklist instead, because they're novices, right? So instead we remind them, think about those cases. What's more, the checklist items also designed to address the common mistakes and test smells that observed in prior studies, as well as the um, in the classrooms. And you can see bad naming is one of them, just like what Christian said, like the naming matters. And the checklist is definitely not a like, golden standard for practicing testing, but it helps the novices to write tests that are um, of good quality and reduce the number of um, like unwanted, um, unneeded, redundant tests. And we found out the checklist works well, and it is at least as effective as um, as a coverage tool like ECL Emma for writing quality tests for the novices which indicates that the tool support does not need to be sophisticated, to be mature, to be effective. And we also found that the novices who have lower prior uh, knowledge in unit testing should benefit more uh, from the checklist.
to summarize most um, novice testers see no difference between testing and debugging. We cannot blame them. Like, and they believe the goal of testing is to show the correctness. Uh, we discussed the challenges that they encountered when practicing testing. And uh, we also showed that a tool support does not need to be sophisticated to be enough. A simple checklist could sometimes do the magic. Um, and I'll open to the questions. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gina. Again, another great talk. Uh, we have time for questions. So if folks do have any, please feel free to be putting those in the Slack. Um, I'll kind of kick things off. I, I, I really find this really interesting, especially since since I've been working at George Mason and I've been teaching a software testing class and reflecting on my own CS education, I realized uh -huh. that I never had that type of education in my, in my, in my you know, explicitly and in, in depth, right, with what it means to write tests, to think about tests. Do you think that part of the problem that led to this research is that we're not focusing on that enough at a deeper level? And do you think that interventions like this could also support how we teach testing, for example? Um. Well, because that's my work, so I, I probably I am probably biased. But the reason why I started uh, to work on testing education is, is that I personally didn't receive any testing education, like formal testing education, when I was undergrad. I didn't see the testing until in grad school doing my PhD work. So I feel like it is important for us to at least try something to, that's not that hard to adopt for both students and professors to apply to 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 help them to teach testing, help them to learn testing. And this is just, again, um, because not many professors had a formal uh, education background in testing. So they probably um, won't touch that deep level of testing. So again, most in most cases, the practice to have just have the students to run the, run their program against the test cases provided by the instructors, and sometimes the test cases be performed by, like provided by the instructors are not even good enough. So Absolutely. I feel that's a yeah. So I feel like the testing, the checklist may work as a good at least a minimal threshold of what what your tasks we need to cover. 